All right, boss, so here it is in a nutshell. These are the error precursors in uh, identifying human performance, right? These are our enemy, and they exist on every job site uh, that we work. So it's a continuing issue, so we have to have a campaign plan to, to combat these error precursors, which result in quality issues and safety issues. So if we're going to have a campaign plan, we're going to address things tactically. If we're going to address things tactically, then we'll start off with the leadership fundamentals. Leadership fundamentals, or the six troop leading steps, are uh, remembered by the acronym BAMSIS. BAMSIS stands for begin the planning, arrange for the reconnaissance, make the reconnaissance, complete the planning, issue the order, and supervise. Now, the order we're talking about is the operations order which is, again, uh, remembered by the acronym OSMIAC. OSMIAC standing for uh, Orientation, Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration, Logistics, and Command and Signals. Now, of course, you begin the planning as soon as you find out you're gonna go someplace. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and orient to where you're going. You wanna go ahead and arrange the reconnaissance to go ahead and see what the work area is gonna be like, right? So. In order to arrange for the reconnaissance, you need to lo know the location. You're going to try and figure out what kind of weather is going to impact your men. And if they're going to be working at night, you want to ensure there's proper illumination. So you've arranged for the reconnaissance. Now, either they're going to go ahead and send you imagery of your working area, or you're going to go ahead and actually go to the site and walk the laydown areas, walk the turbine, try and figure out what kind of local vendors you have to support then you actually go ahead and execute your reconnaissance. Now, on the job site, it's when you actually walk down your work area. Completing the planning process is when you actually go ahead and knock out this operations order. So the operations order, again, the first thing you're gonna do is uh, orient yourself to the area of operations. Then the situation is gonna be a friendly enemy. The friendly is your company. The higher is gonna be the overall issues facing your company, um, what the business model is like, uh, what the, the tone and temper and the climate is within your company. Then you have adjacent, what type of issues are going on throughout the fleet of your company? Are there quality issues that you need to be aware of, be hypersensitive to in order to ensure that your first time quality is happening? Are there safety issues that are trending throughout your company, which highlights opportunities for improvement within your process. Your supporting would be people like your welders, your uh, insulators, your scaffolders. What kind of reputation do they have? What kind of skill sets do they bring? Security is gonna be if you're in Mexico and uh, you required security, or if you're in one of those countries that requires security uh, escort. Attachments and detachments are a means to go ahead and account for your personnel as well as ensure that you understand who's coming and who's going in, ref, uh, in reference to the skill sets that they're bringing to the table, like the welders, the TGR guys, the instrument people. The enemy, again, that is the error precursors or the, uh, the poor human performance. And what you wanna recognize for the enemy is the most dangerous course of action. The most dangerous course of action of your enemy results in a fatality, a life-altering injury, or uh, a a, uh, a catastrophic failure of quality. The most likely uh, uh, course of action is a recordable, not a life-threatening injury, but obviously significantly uh, impactful second and third order negative effects on the company, um, as well as quality issues which result in a loss of time. The mission is gonna be your work scope. The commander's intent, of course, is gonna be execute your work scope in a manner in which nobody gets uh, injured and again with first time quality. The end state is going to be the end of the work scope when they plan on giving the machine back to the customer and of course when they, they plan on uh, starting up first time quality without any issues. Execution is going to be uh, divided into three uh, sub paragraphs, scheme maneuver, fire support plan and task. Scheme maneuver is going to be the inflow of your personnel, your tooling, how you're going to go ahead and, and uh, and expand and collapse your workforce or your footprint in accordance with your work scope. Your fire support plan is how you're gonna prep your objective or your work area. That's when you're gonna bring in your cranes, when you're gonna bring in 
your TGR guys, when you're going to bring in your instrument guys, how are you going to shape your battlefield or your work area to ensure that you can accomplish your scheme maneuver or your, as you were, your, your mission, which is your work scope effectively. Tasks, obviously, are going to be the crew members that come out here to execute the various subtasks within the work scope. Administration and logistics, if we talked about beads, bullets, band-aids, and bad guys, you want to ensure that there's a plan to go ahead and give the men breaks so that they can go ahead and re-energize, get some caffeine into their system in order to combat fatigue, have that lunch. Uh, you want to ensure that you understand what the consumption rate of your consumables, specifically water, is with your data supply on hand and establish a resupply um, using that reverse planning methodology that we're going to speak about here in a minute uh, to ensure that your men don't run out of water. Bullets is going to be your tooling to ensure that they have adequate tooling uh, to, to accomplish the, ta the tasks with the right tool. Band-Aids, as discussed, is going to be the location of the first aid kit, the AED, uh, how we go ahead and uh, contact the control room in order to get emergency medical services on site, as well as the type of care that the urgent care clinic is going to provide, as well as the, uh, the hospitals on station. And when you do that, you can go ahead and ensure that you highlight that that's covered in the read board where you've already identified where the site emergency is, the hospitals, fire department, medical life flight. Um, so now going back to bad guys, bad guys are the people that demonstrate these hazardous attitude and this poor human performance, which results in uh, negative quality or safety issues. So how are you gonna deal with them? Are you gonna counsel them? Are you gonna run them off site? What are you gonna tolerate? And what are the trigger points for immediate removal from site? Coordinating instructions are instructions that apply to two or more companies working within the same workspace. That's your scaffolders, your insulators, as well as your Mitsubishi Pure crew members that, uh, that are working in the same turbine enclosure. So critical vulnerabilities in order to uh, successfully execute our operations order to combat error precursors or poor human performance are an engaged leadership, uh, trained and experienced personnel, and uh, continuous uh, improvement I'm sorry, adequate tooling and then continuous improvement of the personnel process and uh, application of lessons learned. Engaged leadership, you can go ahead and have, go ahead brother, you can go ahead and have uh, some type of uh, manager sitting in the office, but you're not gonna go ahead and be able to effectively accomplish what you wanna do as a leader. A, a leader is not, as you were, somebody that's in the office and not engaged is not gonna be able to, um, understand a shift in a crew member's personality, which is an identifier of a stressor, right? Or uh, a heavy workload or a potential personality conflict, some type, or maybe he's overconfident where, or he's complacent. He's demonstrating a, a poor mindset or a hazardous attitude. Somebody that's in the office isn't gonna know that, right? Trained and experienced personnel, that's obvious. You can't just go ahead and randomly put people out here at the level in which they need to perform out here. Now, the argument's been made, well, the, the work packages are so detailed that if somebody uh, were to simply follow the steps included in the work packages, they should be able to effectively and safely um, knock out the work scope. Well, that's like saying, okay, if I hand somebody a book on marksmanship, he should be able to be an expert marksman or a sniper. It's a skill set that's implied in the ability to come out here and accomplish the tasks in which these men are expected to, and it's certainly not entry level. They need to have a significant amount of training, experience, and supervision in order to freaking go ahead and accomplish the mission. Adequate tooling, that's obvious. If you, if you don't provide the men adequate tooling, they're gonna go ahead and try and find a workaround which puts them in a poor mindset, and that ends up uh, and it sets up the stage for uh, some quality issues and some safety issues. Processes, you, you want to ensure, as you were, continuous improvement. All personnel throughout the entire chain of command, from the top all the way through the entry level guy on his first day on the job, need to be receptive to better ways to go ahead and improve themselves, either professionally and or personally, right? If they don't establish a means to go ahead and highlight a way to improve what they're doing or if they're not even receptive to it, they're gonna stagnate, their skill sets are gonna stagnate, the methodology is gonna improve around them and they're just, they're gonna get overrun 
by uh, somebody that's figured out a better way to do the job. So if you don't work on improving your personnel by training them to be leaders so that you can grow your workforce instead of recruiting your workforce from the outside, you're setting your organization up for failure. Same thing with, with the process. You can't be so in love with your processes that you think that, that there's no other better way to do it. There's always a, uh, an advancement in methodologies, approaches, technologies in, in reference to how to accomplish our work scopes that you need to be um, aware of them and you continue to, to check out industry best practices to ensure that they apply to your, um, your methodologies, your processes. And you need, like, like the OSHA standard states, you, know, you want to go ahead and at a minimum annually assess the efficacy of your processes to ensure that there's no better way to do it or no opportunities for improvement, which brings us to lessons learned. You don't want to go ahead and, and ignore or, or disseminate lessons learned from issues on other project sites because if you don't, again, you're going to be doomed to repeat the same mistakes, um, uh, revisiting the same quality and safety issues which ultimately result in either a higher EMR rating or again, a, a higher cost and a lower profit margin. So critical vulnerabilities, if these things aren't addressed adequately, any of them, if any of these things aren't addressed adequately, it'll result in the long-term failure of the company. And so when we are given our uh, initial tasking, we go through the six troop leading steps and we, identify, we utilize a reverse planning methodology so that we can go ahead and ensure that the implied tasks that we need to accomplish in order to uh, successfully complete our work scope are we have adequate time so that the men aren't rushed, which we want to avoid that time pressure precursor. So once we go ahead and we've established our order and we've given it to the men, we want to ensure that we conduct some inspections. Now here it's weapon gear self, that's the methodology that the military uses. So the weapon, the the big impactful things that we use here are the cranes, the forklifts, and our rigging. We want to ensure that the certifications are current and the, um, the labels are uh, ad, uh, accurate on the rigging and that the forklift certifications and inspection sheets are up to date for obvious reasons. We want to ensure that the personnel operating the cranes and forklifts have the appropriate documentation. The gear. Now, uh, the gear is going to be your tools, your gas cylinders, your hoses, your permits. Those are just examples, right? If you don't have any of those things, you can't adequately and safely complete the tasks and work scope that you're assigned. And then lastly, you want to ensure that you inspect yourself and your personnel for fitness for duty, whether they're physically or mentally fit. When we talk about mentally fit, we want to find out what's going on in their life, right? We want to ensure that they have a familiarity with the task, that they are trained, right? So um, then when we talk about rehearsals, we're looking at that's our PSAs. That's actions on objective. A mental rehearsal is nothing more than going through what you're about to do, talking about the issues and the implied risks associate, associated with the hazards um, uh, of the work area and of the job you're doing. Immediate actions, those are actions you're going to take should something go wrong. That's every, everything from the site evacuation to if there's a rigging issue and you have to get away from the fall zone um, to what happens if there's a fire. Uh, these are the type of issues that you go ahead and you, you rehearse and you and you ensure that the men are intimately familiar with them. Why? Because your reaction time will be faster, it'll be effective, it'll control the chaos that's going to result from an un, unplanned um, event. And then the key elements of success which go ahead and support our uh, critical vulnerabilities is a desensitized, as you were, decentralized leadership and empowered workforce. Uh, ensuring that we develop the situation at the lowest level and a unit of effort with those three subtasks of teamwork, first time quality, and first time safety. The decentralized leadership is ensuring that we don't have to go to the engineer, we don't have to go to the, um, the supervisor or the project manager to get guidance on what to do. We see what's going on, we understand what we need to do to get it done, and we, we're empowered to make the decisions at our level. So once the workforce is empowered, to, and they understand that they have the ability to either stop work uh, because there's an unsafe act or an unsafe condition that exists or there's some issues that need to be addressed, they, they are comfortable escalating those issues for action. Developing the situation at the lowest level is nothing more than that lowest level crew member understands his tasks and he is able to, once he completes a task, 
move on to the subsequent task involved in completing a, a given work scope or um, assigned task without having to go back to the, uh, the supervisor or even cr uh, correcting a, a peer, right? A peer correction coach, mentor, he's developing the situation, he's being that decentralized leader and the workforce is comfortable and empowered. The unity of effort is, hey, you know what? We're all working as a team to accomplish our workforce with first-time quality and first-time safety. Safety being listed third is I hate the fact that we go ahead and say, oh, safety first always. You know what? We need to ensure that these three things are all priority one, right? If we have an individual that is uh, demonstrating a hazardous attitude, he's compromising our ability to go ahead and uh, negate those error precursors and accomplish our uh, operations order or our mission in a timely fashion because other people are having to watch that person or there's uh, rework that's